Good afternoon, and thanks for being with us today. I am Jeff Hoey, Director of Advocacy for New Jersey Peace Action. While we wish we could all be together today face to face, your support in joining us virtually is encouraging and energizing as all heck. Thank you to all that had a part in putting this together. A lot of hard work by many dedicated folks went into this. Thanks, thank you, of course, to Amy Goodman for taking time to be with us today. And thank you and congratulations to our other honorees, Bennett Zorowski and Montclair Mutual Aid. A few quick housekeeping items. Because of the volume of people we have here with us today, we need to keep attendees muted for the duration of the webinar. However, there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen if you need to ask any of the panelists a question uh, regarding functionality. This gathering is being recorded and will be available on YouTube, our YouTube channel uh, early next week. All attendees will be getting a copy of our beautiful dinner journal. We, we used to call it the dinner journal. It's now our spring gathering journal. And a link to the online version will be posted in the chat window. Anyone that ordered a book with their registration will also be receiving those soon. Speaking of the chat window, you'll see links posted there offering more information on what folks are speaking about. There is a button at the bottom of your screen to access chat. You'll also see a button at the bottom of the screen for Q&A. Please use that only for questions for Amy. We asked for questions over the last few weeks and received quite a few ahead of time, and we will get to all that we can get to. We're sorry if you do not get to if we do not get to yours, but we will follow up as best we can with unanswered questions. I'd like to take a moment and ask Lily if you don't mind, join me. Um, I'd like to take a moment and thank Lily Dragnev for being with us today for our conversation with Amy. Lily Dragnev is a national engagement and campaign manager at Peace National Peace Action. Lily's passion for global affairs, and I can speak to this personally, began early thanks to the great example of her political activism laid out by her parents. This led to her to a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and years of leadership in Montessori Model United Nations, teaching young minds the power of diplomacy. Some of her favorite things are visiting relatives in her birthplace, Bulgaria, studying Arabic, God bless you on that, and avoiding Twitter. Lily has been working with Peace Action since 2016 and lives in Oakland, California. Lily is a great colleague to work with and we are very pleased to have her with us today. Lily, we'll be back to you very soon. Thanks very much again. Thanks for having me. Um, Judith Arnold was supposed to be here at this point to give another welcome. Unfortunately, she could not be with us due to a last minute family obligation. And she is beyond disappointed to not be with us today. Per the program, she was going to speak next. And in her place, I'll read her welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to New Jersey Peace Actions spring peace gathering. We're so glad you could join us. As with the world in general this year, there have been changes at New Jersey Peace Action. Jeff Hoey, who has been our executive director for the last two years, is now director of advocacy, a position that will help to further our work toward peace. We welcome Adam Hockenberry as our director of outreach. As his title suggests, you'll be hearing from him about all of our efforts in that regard. As always, I want to recognize the work of our board of directors for all they do. Thank you to Peggy Mongees, Anna Nelson, Virginia Ahern, Don Leach, Howard Lipoff, Helga Moore, Mary Bell, and John Kanicki, and Lev and Victoria Pinsky for their work on the special events committee. A huge amount of gratitude goes to all the people who put so much work into making this event happen. Greg Payson, our office manager, and Sherry Rays, our person in charge of development, are behind the scenes here, letting each of us take our turn on screen and monitoring the chat window. And the people who work so hard on our journal, Mary Gallagher, Anna Nelson, Sherry Rays, thank you so much. As always, the talented Johnny Keane designed the journal cover and did such a wonderful job. Our thanks go out to our board members and donors, our, I'm sorry, our members and donors, for your belief in us and our important work we do to achieve peace. We will continue in this effort with your support. I will now introduce board member John Kanicki, who will present our Person of the Year Award. 
So John and Bennett, if you'll join me on screen, thank you. I'm gonna pop off. Thank you very much for being here. And over to you, John. Hello, I'm board member John Konecki. Bennett Zorowski's parents supported New Jersey Peace Action and young Bennett went to the office to stuff envelopes. While Bennett was a student at Rutgers, he received important advice for NJPA regarding the draft for the Vietnam War and how to become a conscientious objector. He also did a fair share of organizing against the war. Bennett gave a go as a folk singer before becoming a lawyer. Bennett never regrets his decision because he maintained his artistic career through the Solidarity Singers. Bennett is a people's lawyer and NJPA's counsel as well. Bennett represents unions and never corporations. Also, he represents activists pro bono. Bennett can literally get a phone call and spend countless hours devoting, devoted to the defense of some activists. Bennett wears many hats and, one, and the one I would like to introduce him as today is as a friend, but not just a friend to me, but a friend to the downtrodden. Bennett is truly a person who has a genuine love and compassion for his fellow human being and is willing to dedicate his time, resources, and life in pursuit of a more just world. I will now read the plaque, which we cannot unfortunately give to Bennett in person. I know it will look great hanging on the walls of the law office among the pictures of Big Bill Haywood, Woody Guthrie, and Joe Hill. I am both honored and privileged to present the award of the New Jersey Peace Action Person of the Year to Bennett D. Zorowski for his lifelong activism for labor and social justice with guitar and songbook in hand. Thank you very much for the kind words, John, and to New Jersey Peace Action for honoring me in this way. I've been uh, going to these what used to be dinners for I don't know how many years. I know I've been connected to this organization for over 60 years because my parents used to make me drink powdered milk to avoid the strontium 90 that was coming from the fallout from the above ground nuclear testing that SANE was one of the leading groups fighting against. And I wish I could say it wasn't still an issue today, but with the Iran peace deal hopefully going to be reinitiated, but they're still talking about modernizing and replacing our nuclear arsenal. They're still refusing to decommission the land-based ICBMs that we have. If we wanna move the money from war to people, the nuclear weapons budget would be a great place for this country to start. It used to be that that was the primary existential threat facing the country, the world rather. And now of course, it seems as though climate change has overcome them. Two plagues made by human beings that we should all be working every day to get to leave, to get rid of, I should say. And I'm glad to be a part of Peace Action all these years, which has focused so much, especially on nuclear disarmament. But I often see people from Peace Action at the environmental demonstrations also. I'm gonna sing a song rather than talk. This is uh, Pazi Libertad by Jose Luis Orozco. And you can sing it along. You'll catch on with the chorus if you don't already know. Para los niños, para los viejos, 
are all of Coleraine, it ain't most cause for the children, for the elders, for the poor. We all want peace. Uh, Treasurer Don Leach. Hi, um, I'm Treasurer Don Leach. A little over a year ago, as the reaction to the pandemic was unfolding, some members of the Montclair community called for a series of Zoom meetings to see what they could do to help others in this time of need. Modeling their endeavor after other mutual aid groups, they determined that their mission would be to foster a network of people and groups in Montclair to help each other meet their critical needs. Hi, should I keep going? Yeah, okay. Uh, Montclair Mutual Aid with its motto, solidarity, not charity, took on food insecurity as an issue in need of immediate attention. They then established a series of little food pantries set up throughout town and did their best to keep them well stocked, all items free for the taking. Along with the Northeast Earth Coalition, they developed and maintained community gardens, growing fresh produce to stock the pantries, to supply Tony's Kitchen, a church based food ministry and to provide seniors and others in needs. In collaboration with existing nonprofits, churches and other groups, they worked with the New Newark Water Coalition to help distribute clean water, 
worked with Montclair Moms of Color to distribute food and toiletries, mounted a number of live outdoor musical events with Parents Who Rock, and even adopted families to fulfill holiday wishes. Recognizing that menstrual products are essential but also expensive, MMA created its Aisle 7 project to offer them for free. Montclair Mutual Aid member Shar O'Dare is with us today as New Jersey Peace Action honors Montclair Mutual Aid with the Sylvia and Oscar Acklesburg Peace Award for their compassionate and collaborative efforts to meet the needs of their local community. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Don, for that wonderful introduction. Um, hi, my name is Charlotte Gadler, um, and I know I speak on behalf of all of the members of Montclair Mutual Aid when I say we're so honored to be accepting the Sylvia and Oscar, Oscar Acklesberg Award from New Jersey Peace Action. Thank you so much for recognizing our work. It really, really means the world to us. So since March 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, Montclair Mutual Aid has been committed to organizing in the Montclair area to meet neighbors' material needs and address previously existing issues in town like food insecurity that were exacerbated by the pandemic. You know, actually, as we speak right now, um, a large group of our organizers are distributing groceries, clothes, toiletries, menstrual projects, and toys and games at uh, one of our monthly distribution events in Glenfield Park in Montclair, where there's also live music from Parents Who Rock, one of our collaborators. Um, in just a little over one year through organizing, we've been able to accomplish um, so many things, um, everything from grocery, clean water fund and menstrual project product distribution to community gardening and community arts events. Um, in addition to thanking New Jersey Peace Action, we also wanna thank all of our organizers whose tireless work has made all of this possible, all of our supporters in the community and all of the other organizations that have organized together with us, including the Northeast Earth Coalition, Tony's Kitchen, Montclair Moms of Color, the Newark Water Coalition, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair, Parents Who Rock, and so many others. Um, thank you again to New Jersey Peace Action um, for being amongst our supporters and for having us here and honoring us with uh, this award. Um, your recognition and belief in us and our work will allow us to go forward and do more research resource sharing work and building solidarity and people power in the Montclair area in 2021 and honor onward. So thank you so much again. Um, and apologies that I didn't prepare a song as well. It's a hard, hard act to follow, but thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shark. Um, we're doing things a bit differently this year. Instead of one person explaining what we've been up to in the past year, there'll be two. First, Jeff Hoey will update you on our political activism, and then Adam Hockenberry will talk about the outreach we've done. And I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, Don. Um, thank you all again for being here. Uh, I wanna spend just a few minutes updating you on our advocacy efforts over the last year and what we have upcoming this year. We've been busy, and from what we are seeing since the election, we will remain busy. One thing about being a peace activist in the United States is the unfortunate job security. New Jersey Peace Action was formed in 1957, as many of you know, to oppose the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Staying with our core issue, much of our work revolves around the effort to mitigate the danger of the weapons and their eventual elimination. We are making progress. This past January, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force making nuclear weapons illegal under international law as weapons of mass destruction. The treaty has been signed by 86 nations and ratified by 54. This is this historic, monumental, and just one sign of the real momentum building around the globe towards our goal. New Jersey Peace Action is working every day on our back from the Brink uh, campaign. It's a grassroots effort to build support at a local effort towards these five points. We are trying to actively pursue, pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals, renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first, 
ending the sole unchecked authority of any U.S. president to launch a nuclear attack, taking U.S. nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert, and canceling the plan to replace the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. Everyone here can help with our Back from the Brink campaign. We're actively talking to local organizations, urging them to endorse these goals. Many of these organizations are churches and community and labor organizations. If you're a member of a faith group or other group, please get in touch with me. My email address will be in the chat window and I welcome hearing from you. We're also working on finding supporters now of among elected officials at the local and county level to endorse our work. <clears throat> and to champion our goal of having resolutions passed, urging the federal government to listen to all of us and to end the madness. If you know any of your local officials, please let me know. We'll get in touch with them. We just need the warm intro. This is a local issue. Money being spent on these immoral and now illegal weapons can be and should be spent on things that truly make us safer, better healthcare and educational systems, and working on human issues, such as lack of food security, which our honoree today is doing so much wonderful work on. There'll be a link in the chat window for more info on Back from the Brink and a lot of the things I'm speaking about. We also continue to engage your representatives and senators at the federal level in regular lobby meetings where we make a case for our issues. Issues like stopping the blockade of Yemen, which is making the worst humanitarian crisis on earth even worse. Over 2 million people are in dire need of food and basic medical attention and 400,000 children. Innocent children are in danger of starving by the end of this year. It's truly heartbreaking and it can and must be stopped. We need your help with this as well. You're all constituents of these officials and they actually want to hear from you. Lobby meetings these days are virtual. You don't even need to leave your home to participate. We'll train you and guide you through the entire process. But we need you because these officials want to talk to voters in their district. You can help. Again, take a look in the chat and shoot me an email letting me know you'd like to talk about helping. Anyone here can do it and we need you. We're making progress and it's because of your help. We were successful in having a number of Congress people from New Jersey sign a letter urging the end of the blockade. We need to do more. We were instrumental in Senator Booker not signing a letter attempting to sabotage the U.S. rejoining the Iran nuclear deal. And we now have almost half of the New Jersey congressional delegation now supporting no first use of nuclear weapons. We can always do more. President Biden just proposed another increase to the war budget over what even President Trump wanted. Frankly, it's insanity. But there is now real momentum against these forces that profit from endless war. We're actively working on Back from the Brink and are in the process of scheduling ongoing lobby meetings. We're restarting our weekly peace vigils in Montclair, and there are ongoing vigils in Leonia, Teaneck, and Morristown. Please let us know if you can help. Checking our website out event calendar for news on upcoming programs and meetings, including our next quarterly meeting, open to all on June 10th. There will be a link in the chat window on that as well. Feel the need to reach out to me anytime. Most of you folks have my cell number. It's in all my emails. Feel free to, free, feel free to call me anytime. Please join us. Thank you again for being here. I would now like to introduce my colleague, Adam Hockenberry. Adam, over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, hi, everybody. It's so nice to be able to meet you, even if virtually. Um, and thank you again for being here with us today. So I joined Peace Action, New Jersey Peace Action. I joined Peace Action a little while ago, but New Jersey Peace Action just a few months ago. And I'm so happy to be a part of such a historical organization. I joined NJPA after years working, well, briefly working last year for Senator Raphael Warnock's successful Senate campaign and spending my undergraduate years on, as an on-campus organizer at Hofstra University. I'm so excited to be here now 
And I feel as if the privilege I've had to have been able to work uh, and learn and guide my education uh, surrounded by peace and, and, and geared for peace, um, to be able to bring it home and to be able to, to do the work that I've been training to do for so long. As a young person in the peace movement who has to have that privilege, I, I, I can't even begin to explain how thrilled I am and how excited I am to get to meet everybody. As director of outreach, I'm involved in many aspects of our organization, such as special events planning, fundraising, communications, and much more. I'm particularly excited, however, to get to work with young people across the state. High school students in particular, they're so often funneled into the war machine, and there are rarely any pro-peace pro voices that are able to give a counterpoint to military recruiters that prey upon high school students. And that happens all across the country, particularly in low-income areas. I wanna be a voice for peace, and right now, I am thankful for the heightened focus surrounding social justice amongst youth in America. But as we know, the Pentagon can and will continue to distort the message of social justice as false justification for war, making imperialism woke. Even last week, there were articles written last advising against President Biden's, President Biden's withdrawal of forces from Afghanistan, citing working conditions and women, working conditions for women as a justification for our uh, remain presence in Afghanistan. These falsehoods and bogus justifications are easily sniffed out by those of us working within the world of peace, but for a child looking for an opportunity to build a fulfilling future and secure future in a very difficult world and difficult time, that understanding we have come to must not be assumed for our youth. I cherish the opportunity once COVID is more under control and I can do so safely to work directly with youth in New Jersey at both the high school and the undergraduate level. And if I can recruit just one person away from a future in the US military into the world of peace and organizing, well, I can't even describe how rewarding that would be. I will cherish every opportunity I have to promote peace to the generations that follow and to make New Jersey Peace Action younger and to make it be able to thrive and prosper and, and to be able to grow the organization. These are all things I'm incredibly excited to have the opportunity to do. So it, there are ways that you can help that because we cannot do this work without you. And to talk a little bit more about that, I'm going to pass it over to our fundraising chairperson, Virginia Ahern. Virginia's anti-nuclear activism started as a student of Rutgers University in the early 1980s and brought her, into the, brought her to the Seneca Women's Peace Camp, demonstrations at the Nevada nuclear test site, and now to New Jersey Peace Action in the late 1980s. She is now our fundraising chair. And in 2007, she was named by our national office as one of the 100 most important women peacemakers in the world. So I will pass it over to Virginia and I will look forward to hearing from you all. My email has been posted in the chat and I'm really, really looking forward to getting to know you all at a more individual level. And I can't wait to get my way over to New Jersey to meet you in person. Thank you again for listening and uh, here's, take it over Virginia. Hello, everyone. Hello. We are, it is so wonderful that you are here with us today. I want to especially welcome first-time attenders to a New Jersey Peace Action event. And you heard from Jeff Hoey about all of our wonderful advocacy work, Back from the Brink, our peace vigils, the, the virtual lobby visits, and we really hope that all of you will sign up or help in some way with these efforts. And Adam Hockenberry, our Director of Outreach, we are so excited to have him with us. Uh, he will be building the next generation of peace activists with NJPA. Uh, and those of you who have been involved with us for a long time know how long uh, we have needed this. And the moment is here. Adam is here with us, we're thrilled. He's gonna be building that next generation uh, and uh, we are, beyond excited. There are so many ways to work for a better world. I'm taking a few minutes uh, to tell you a couple of different ways that you can support NJPA and then we will have Amy Goodman. The backbone of our organization is our sustainer program. I wanna take a moment and thank all of you who are monthly and quarterly contributors to the organization. I wanna encourage the rest of you to please join this program. Whether you can give $500 a quarter, yes, we know that's a lot of money, uh, $50 a quarter or $15 a quarter. 
it all makes a huge difference. One of our sustainers gives $160 a month and other monthly sustainers give $7 a month. You can choose the amount and together we will get more activism done. Two more things to spur you on to this. Jeff Hoey, our director of advocacy, is a sustainer. He donates back some of his salary to NJPA. And additionally, today, six of the board members who, by the way, we put in about 50 hours a week collectively of volunteer work to help make this organization go. And today, six of us are pledging to give $10 for each new sustainer who joins. So if you sign up, another $60 gets thrown in on top of that. Uh, we have a goal today of 20 new sustainers. And if this way of contributing doesn't work for you, consider making a one-time gift uh, and make it as large as you can. Uh, we, have a, um, we have a springtime goal of $25,000. Uh, and perhaps there's some of you who could give a thousand or 500. And we know we don't have Fortune 500 executives in our ranks. Maybe you can get someone uh, can give more than a thousand uh, or 500 or 100 or 50 or 25 or 10, it all will go a long way. One other way to slice this is that if everyone here today was able to give $50 more, we would be about one third of the way toward our goal. I also wanna thank you all because you've purchased a ticket today. And for some of you, that is your donation to us and we thank you. Jeff will be posting uh, in the, um, in the chat or maybe Sherry will be a website, our website to donate and a link to our donation page. Please, as I'm, as I'm winding down here, open up that link, make a pledge right now or do it right after the program. Show us the love and support, show love and support for the next generation of peacemakers. Give generously, you all make a huge difference and we thank you. I'm gonna turn the screen over now to Helga Moore. She's a board member, a longtime activist, and she has quite a respectable civil disobedience rap sheet. She will be introducing Amy Goodman. Thank you all. Actually, this just in, Helga is having technical difficulties today, so much in the same way as Broadway. I'm Sherry Race, your development person, and I will be playing the part of Helga Moore. And Helga was kind enough to provide her words to me. So imagine her beautiful face in place of mine as I read her words to you. We are honored and delighted to say welcome home to Amy Goodman. Not only was she with us once before, but she is also the daughter of two very active anti-nuclear activists of the 1980s. Her mother coincidentally was the founder of a chapter of Sane slash Freeze Peace Action's previous incarnation. She has done her parents proud. With her daily broadcast, Democracy Now! on 1400 public radio and TV stations, she is the country's most widely heard progressive journalist. Every day, she gives us the news we need to know and what we can hear nowhere else. I first learned of her in the early 90s when I happened to turn on WBAI and heard a young woman being beaten and arrested by US supported Indonesian soldiers during the East Timor uprising. All the while she had her microphone in hand. To say the least, her reporting informs us of the often unheard ugly truths of our time. But she also gives us hope in telling us of the brave struggles against injustice at home and throughout the world. For this, she has received numerous prestigious awards listed in the journal. I'll point out just one, the I.F. Stone Medal. The older folks will remember Izzy Stone from the 60s who told us all governments lie, some more than others. Amy reminds us of that truth constantly. In her spare time, she has co-authored six New York Times bestsellers. Her latest is Democracy Now!, 20 years covering the movements changing America. It is our privilege to bestow to Amy Goodman 
the Dorothy Eldridge Peacemaker Award, named after the woman who founded the first chapter of SANE, now New Jersey Peace Action. To Amy Goodman for her courageous reporting, uncovering the truth about global conflict and championing those standing up to oppression. With that, I give you Lily Dragnev and Amy Goodman. Thank you so much, Sherry, and thank you, Amy, for your time and being here with us today. Um, I am very eager to hear your thoughts on the pre-submitted questions. I'm sure the audience is as well, and so we can just dive right in, um, and I want to give you the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, obviously, this award was well-deserved, and you have served as a peacemaker throughout your career, so I'd like to ask a little bit as to the roots of that and, and you know, hear any words you may have to say about, um, you know, your early experiences around activism and your parents, uh, as Sherry and Helga so um, wonderfully explained, your parents were involved in activism and as someone whose parents were also fairly active in the student uprisings against the Bulgarian communist regime, I know that that fueled my own love for political engagement and activism. So certainly interested to hear about your early experiences with that and how it helped shape affect you through your childhood? Well, uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here with you, to be with, um, to come back home, as you said, to New Jersey Peace Action. It definitely feels like that. You all have such a place in my heart. Um, the first name of your founder, Dorothy, was my mother's name. And yes, she founded the first Sane Freeze chapter on Long Island. Both my mother and my father were longtime peace activists. My dad was in Physicians for Social Responsibility. And they very much, along with my grandparents and my whole family, my extended family, my three brothers, have helped shape my worldview, going back to the Holocaust, because my family, of course, goes back to that, fled the persecution of the pogroms at the beginning of the century, um, came here, though we did lose family members in the Holocaust. My mother used to describe in the summer going up to these um, Catskill bungalows and she would play outside and hear her mother's wail go up when she heard about another family member killed. Um, my dad not only was involved with nuclear, uh, anti-nuclear activism, but he was the head of a task force in Bayshore, Long Island, uh, to integrate our schools. We had a diverse community, but there was that figurative and real, those were the railroad tracks. How do we bring our community together? How as children are we educated together? <coughs> and as a fifth grader, I used to go with him into the <clears throat> elementary schools of our community into the auditoriums and the cafeterias with a thousand screaming parents. He received death threats and <clears throat> I would watch as he judiciously navigated um, the way for our community to come together and to live with each other, to learn together, to, um, uh, to integrate our educational system in Bayshore, Long Island. By the way, I'm going to warn you, one thing I have a cold, and the second thing is I have a new little puppy who is just spayed and is not very happy. I tried to convince her this afternoon she's on a spaycation, but she didn't buy it. Um, so if she cries out a little, I, I might be having to give her something, uh, but she's quiet for now. Um, so that really was the beginning of my learning about journalism and activism because my older brother um, was active on the newspaper in um, high school. And when my dad was doing this anti-racist work, my brother would sit by his study and he would put his ear to the door. And when my dad would come out with a, uh, coming out of a conversation on the phone, my brother would say, I have everything I need. My father would say, what are you talking about? I, what, what do you have? And so he said, well, I heard that conversation. Now I'm going to quote it. He said, no, that was off the record. He said, no, according to the rules, you have to say something's off the record before you start talking, not after. My 
brother would say. My father would say, I did not know you were eavesdropping. My father would chase my brother down the stairs and my brother would run out onto the lawn screaming, freedom of the press, freedom of the press. So uh, that inspired me early on that you could take on power. In that case, it was my father and that power was a very just power. Um, but I was active on my junior high school and high school newspaper. Um, then it was holding the principal to account, and then it's just going to a larger stage and holding presidents and prime ministers to account. Uh, I think all of us in our work, you know, we're all in the same ship and we look out in different portals on that uh, same sea and we figure out what our passion is. And I think that's where we can do the best work. Um, but I thank my parents and my grandparents, my grandmother, my mother's mother, was a woman of three centuries. She was born in 1897, uh, Sonia Bach, and she lived till she was 108 at 2005. Um, in 2005, I visited her very often in Brooklyn. And one day I said, I mean, maybe she was 107 and she was complaining of corns on her toes or something. But I said to her, I'm going to come visit you next week. I, no, I, I said I wanted to come visit her that day. And she said, Emila, darling, you cannot come. Um, and so I said, why not? She says, um, I am, uh, I've been heavily drugged. And my grandmother never took any kind of drugs. And so I said, what do you mean you're heavily drugged? And so she said, I had an aspirin, um, a half an aspirin yesterday, and I'm still feeling the effects. Um, but they taught me about what it is to li live life fully. My grandfather was an Orthodox rabbi, ran a, the yesh a yeshiva in Brooklyn for 40 years. They deeply were committed to education. Um, and that's what influenced my mother taught women's history and literature, as well as being a peace activist. Um, a lot of the books you see here come also from her library and my father's library. Books were the um, wallpaper uh, of our house. They were uh, the backdrop of everything. Um, when my parents were moving from Bayshore to Stony Brook after we all left the house, uh, my dad was in a wheelchair. He had multiple sclerosis and they had to sell things so they could move to the new house. And um, we were looking for my dad and we we're saying, where is he? We had this open house sale and I found him in the living room. His, he, he was in his chair with his back to all of us. And he had two piles of books on each name. I said, dad, what are you doing? He said, I promise I'll pay for them. I'm buying our books back. Um, that is, shows just the love of learning and of constantly widening our horizons all of our lives. That's what I grew up with. And I thank them, though I've lost both of them. Um, they have both since passed. Uh, they live with me and my brothers um, and my nieces and nephews every day for what they bestowed on us. Certainly, yeah. It sounds like, you know, they, they left a massive impact and probably on everyone who who knew them and and they were able to touch but also just through you and the the role that you have played for peace and activism throughout your life um of which of course we're so very grateful here at new jersey peace action and peace action nationally um and so someone was curious about what your most personally satisfying endeavors were in your years of activism through adulthood so in those moments of holding prime ministers and presidents accountable and and you know your career is there a particular moment or two that stick out as as some of the most personally satisfying um, I would, there's so many um, different moments, so much uh, I have been inspired by. <coughs> um, I mean, I go back to East Timor in 1991. I went there with my colleague, journalist Alan Nairn in 90 and 91 at the time. And as was described before, Indonesia occupied East Timor. Um, it was the fourth largest army in the world. East Timor was a tiny um, country, 300 miles above Australia. It had been occupied by Indonesia since 1975. They killed off a third of the population, one of the great genocides of the 20th century. In 1991, when we were there, the Indonesian military 
engaged in a massacre, yet another massacre of the people. We were at the cemetery where the people had marched and we walked to the front of the crowd, just hoping that our role as Western journalists could somehow prevent what we saw was a massacre. The Indonesian soldiers would be a massacre. The Indonesian soldiers marched up with the USM 16s at the ready position, 10 to 12 abreast. Um, we're at the front of the crowd. I was recording, Alan was photographing and uh, they just swept past us and opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. Um, they beat me to the ground. Alan threw himself on top of me to protect me. And they took their USM 16s like baseball bats and slammed them against his skull until they fractured it. We were able to get into a Red Cross Jeep. Uh, the Jeep took us to the hospital. We decided to go into hiding because we knew the soldiers would come to the hospital. And when we went to the site, um, uh, the next site uh, where the Bishop lived, uh, Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello, who would later win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he helped me clean up Alan because you know, his skull was fractured and we raced to the airport. We saw we could not stop this massacre, only outside pressure could do it. So we had to get word to the outside world. Um, ultimately they killed more than 270 Timorese that day. It was absolutely horrific. Um, it taught us such an incredible lesson when we got to the hospital, um, uh, when the Red Cross took us to the hospital before we left the country. Um, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. And I think it's because they understood what for the Timorese was the, uh, not only Americans, but people in the West, what we mean. Um, to the people of East Timor. And that was two things, the sword and the shield. The sword was what our US government represented. The shield is what the people represented. And that day, that shield was bloodied. We came back to the United States, continually talked about what was happening, but the bravery was the people of East Timor. Unbelievable that they stood up against the occupation until eight years later, they were able to vote for their independence, for their freedom. Um, that was one thing that shaped me um, in so many ways, um, seeing a grassroots movement grow up around the world, um, not to fund human rights abusing regimes, not to arm human rights abusing regimes. And then I'll take it forward to 2016, uh, Democracy Now! went out to North Dakota to the standoff at Standing Rock. And there we saw, um, thousands of indigenous, not only Native Americans, people, uh, indigenous people from Latin America, First Nations of Canada. It was Labor Day weekend of that, you know, incredible presidential election year, Clinton versus Trump. Um, but they weren't talking about climate crisis. In the debates leading up to the election, not one question was asked about climate change, let alone this historic epic moment. Um, the largest gathering of indigenous people in decades, standing up against the Dakota Access Pipeline, standing up for a sustainable um, future, um, standing up against pipeline politics. The Dakota Access Pipeline was owned by Energy Transfer Partners. And it was there um, on that weekend of Labor Day 2016 that my colleagues and I from Democracy Now!, Dennis Moynihan, John Hamilton, um, uh, and Laura Gottesdiener, we were there um, covering the protests just to give voice to people at the grassroots. Yeah, I see our role is to go to where the silence is. Um, and, you know, it's often not quiet. It's raw, rowdy, it's raucous, it just doesn't hit the corporate media radar screen. And we covered a group of Native Americans going to plant their flags at a sacred burial ground. They saw the Dakota Access Pipeline, the DAPL, um, uh, uh, the DAPL um, trucks that were there, uh, the, the bulldozers that were there, those land crushing machines, and they stood in front of them because a judge was supposed to rule on this a few days later, whether they should have access to the site, but they were just destroying it anyway. Um, 
so that it would be a moot point when the judge ruled and the people said no. And they stood girls, women, men, boys, and they walked forward and the bulldozers actually pulled back. And that's when the guards unleashed dogs on the, they didn't call themselves protesters, they called themselves water protectors. And the guards unleashed dogs on them. Uh, we filmed a dog with its nose and mouth covered in blood. Um, but the people kept marching. They were beaten, they were bitten, they were maced, they were pepper sprayed, but they kept moving forward. And so ultimately, uh, the dapple guards and bulldozers pulled away. It was ridiculously high price to pay. Um, but that was their bravery. And we put up the film that night. Now I've been invited on CNN and MSNBC, and I would often ask the host, why don't you talk about the climate crisis, the climate catastrophe. And they would say that the executives say they don't get enough eyeballs um, you know, on their social media or watching TV when they talk about climate change. We put up this video and within 24 hours, there were 14 million views. Any corporate exec of a network would drool to get that kind of, uh, those kind of numbers. It just wasn't true. I don't know if it has anything to do with, I'm not just talking Fox. I was talking at the time, MSNBC, CNN. Um, I mean, they took a stronger stance during the Trump years because Trump personally targeted them. Sometimes they would sound like democracy now, you know, holding those in power accountable. But I am talking about all of the networks that break every, you all know this, six, seven minutes uh, brought to you by an oil company or a weapons manufacturer or a bank responsible for redlining and economic injustice. Um, that's why independent media is so important. And that's why we were there and other networks weren't at that moment. Um, and so we, we, un, we loaded up that video. We came back home to New York. And a few days later, when the judge was going to rule, the governor of North Dakota at the time, Governor Dal Rimple, the night before the ruling, called out the National Guard. It didn't look good for the Native Americans. What I didn't know at the time is they had issued an arrest warrant for me. And this goes to why the media is so critical. An arrest warrant? Well, I didn't know. And my colleague, Nermeen Sheikh, and I were, <coughs> were going to Canada on Friday for the Toronto International Film Festival because, as was said before, <coughs> um, we were there to speak after a film on the great journalist I.F. Stone. And it was called All Governments Lie. He had said to young people, if you can remember two words, remember governments lie. If you can remember three words, remember all governments lie. You should all see this documentary. And so we weren't fleeing to Canada. We were really invited. And I didn't know there was an arrest warrant for me. So the next day I was supposed to speak at the University of Toronto. I always have my phone with me. And in the middle of my talk, I looked down and it says you're under arrest. I thought one of the students at the school had like hacked my phone. And then I looked more carefully and I saw it was a North Dakota number. I thought this could be real. Oh my God. Now, if there's an arrest warrant for you, you're not necessarily going to be arrested immediately. But if there is, but if you have a direct encounter with FBI or police or border guards, then you're going to be taken. And I was in Canada. I had to get home. And I thought, what if I could beat this arrest warrant, if in fact it's true? I didn't want to let people know what was going on. And so I just said um, from, from the dais, could someone call me a cab? I raced to the airport. I beat the arrest warrant. So I was able to come back home. And it was true. Um, they'd issued an arrest warrant. And I really felt it was critical, especially for young journalists, that we should go back and challenge this arrest warrant. Because what if you don't have an institution behind you? And this was an epic moment. And young journalists who are independent, who want to go and cover something like this, I absolutely encourage that. And they wouldn't be able to do this if they could just be arrested. So we went back to North Dakota. And as we landed, I talked to my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had one before. And I said, well, what's happened? He said, they've just withdrawn the arrest warrant, um, but they have now charged you with a more serious felony. I said, for what? For showing this film? And they said, for riot. What, I'm a one woman riot? 
But this is why it's so important to just show up, to be there, to bear witness. Um, so I said, how much time do I have? He said, you'll be arraigned in three days. So I thought that's enough time to cover the protest for a few days. And then that Monday morning, the show must go on. And so we did the broadcast from where I was going to be arraigned, from in front of the courthouse, which was next to the jail, in between were the Ten Commandments. And we broadcast from across the street on church property. And I interviewed the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux. Um, his name was, at the time, Chairman Dave Archambault. And I said, have you been arrested? He said, yes, I was charged with a misdemeanor for civil disobedience. I said, what happened to you? He said, I was strip searched. I was put in an orange jumpsuit and I was jailed. I mean, he's a 45th chairman, like Trump was a 45th president of the United States. He was strip searched, put in an orange jumpsuit. I talked to the pediatrician of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle. Were you ever arrested? She was one of the first. She said, yes, what happened? She was put, she was strip searched, put in an orange jumpsuit and jailed. How much humiliation can a people take? And yet they continued and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Native Americans, well over 700 were arrested as they fought for a sustainable future, not just for them, for the Dakota Access Pipeline not to go under the Missouri River, endangering the water of 17 million people downstream, not just Native American, but for the world, they were leading an ecological movement and they continue to do that. Um, as after we did our show, I was going to turn myself in, but then we got word that the judge, um, they were not gonna move forward with this arraignment because there was too much attention on a journalist being arrested. This is what happens when the media shines a spotlight in the right direction. And I should say that the Native Americans who were being charged that day with felonies and misdemeanors, many of them had their charges dropped as well. That's the kind of reality TV we should support, showing the reality of people's lives on the ground. Those are a few of the um, moments uh, the, of incredible bravery from the Timorees to the Standing Rock Sioux um, that have inspired me. Yes, yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, and you know, really, really grateful again for you shining that spotlight for, for being present. Um, and you know, you mentioned, obviously the, the corporate, more mainstream media outlets, and they're not shining enough of a spotlight on these situations, um, you know, whether it be climate activism or, um, you know, nuclear, anti-nuclear activism. Uh, Bennett had mentioned water crises due to nuclear radioactive elements and things like that, um, you know, his concerns when he was a child and how that was such a prevalent uh, danger and fear that that just lingered over the generation. Um, and, you know, the, the doomsday clock right now is at 100 seconds to midnight, and yet among the general public, there doesn't seem to be as much concern as there once was. And, um, you know, you've obviously interviewed Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg about these things, as well as having your own history uh, reporting about the nuclear danger. And so do you have a sense as to why there isn't enough of a spotlight on these things? Um, you know, the ICBM missiles and, and the new upgrades to the land-based um, leg of the nuclear triad and things that Bennett alluded to as well. There's just not as much coverage outside of your work. So do you have a sense as to both why that's happening and how we as activists can help assist you in shining a spotlight on that? And of course, the Iran nuclear deal, the fact that Trump pulled out of the yes. Iran nuclear deal. Um, <clears throat> you know, especially now, it is absolutely critical because we've moved from Trump to Biden, to Biden-Harris. And I think Trump metaphorically and actually represented a wall. And Biden-Harris represent a door. I'm not saying that door is open. I'm just saying it's a door. Maybe it's open a crack. The question is, will it be kicked open or slammed shut? And that's really not up to them. It's up to movements. Movements are so important. Whether we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, <coughs> or we're talking about the peace movement. I mean, look at what's happened in the last few weeks. President Biden has announced the US is pulling out of Afghanistan, which is extremely significant, and we'll do it by September 11th. 
Actually, the New York Times reported it's not everyone that they're uh, pulling out. I mean, it looks like there'll be something like 18,000 contractors, intelligence, et cetera, still in Afghanistan. At the same time, instead of cutting the military budget, he's supporting an increase in the military budget. Uh, we just interviewed, for example, Congressman Ro Khanna, someone who's very much opposed to that. Think of Barbara Lee, the remarkable African-American congresswoman from Oakland, who is the sole voice against um, the um, against going into Afghanistan. She faced death threats at the time after the September 11th attacks, but she stood firm. She is calling for this cut in the military budget. Um, and because there is such an enormous sense of relief, I think, of this, uh, of having removed this racist, xenophobic, hate-filled, anti-science, uh, pandemic-promoting president, President Trump. Um, it is absolutely critical that we hold whoever is in office, the president, accountable. As my colleague Jeremy Scahill says over at The Intercept, who used to be at Democracy Now!, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democratic president. We are the same journalists. We have a job, and that is to look at what's happening domestically. And certainly President Biden has been proposing, you know, massive changes in this country, but also in terms of foreign policy to highlight what doesn't get as much attention. Now, with the money that is saved around, you know, being in Afghanistan, of course, that should be a model for coming out of Iraq as well. Um, we're very much seeing just a shift of militaristic focus to return to a Cold War with Russia and also generate one with China. And I think that's a grave concern. But we are not out of this pandemic right now. And this is absolutely critical. I mean, it's very important um, that people are vaccinated in this country. But the U.S. is not playing a positive role when it comes to the world being vaccinated. Now, even if you don't want to look at this humanistically, which I do look at, and I'm sure most of you do, if you don't want to look at altruistically, but simply serving the self-interest of the United States, if the pandemic has taught us anything, if anyone gets sick anywhere, we are all at risk. And it's critical that all over the world, there is vaccine equity, that we fight vaccine apartheid. We had on Dr. Craig Spencer. He ran the emergency room and global health um, department up at uh, Columbia University. He was in West Africa, got Ebola when he was fighting the Ebola epidemic. Um, and he said he was one of the first to get the shot, two shots, because he's on the front line. And he said, with those two shots, he said, I have gotten more vaccines than 130 countries in the world. How is that possible? Now, there are ways to turn this around. Um, there is a big movement out of South Africa and Brazil to fight for um, a waiver at the World Trade Organization around intellectual property that would require that the companies that are making these vaccines share the vaccine recipes, for example, with other companies. I mean, in fact, Biden has a model right here um, with Johnson & Johnson. He set up Johnson & Johnson with Merck, that who, and that company did not develop the vaccine, but had the capacity to uh, make more vaccines. So they work out these deals. And you could work them out all over the world. There are many companies that haven't developed the vaccine, but have the capacity to um, to make these vaccines. But the US opposed the waiver at the World Trade Organization to the dismay of so many around the world. We must ensure everyone who wants a vaccine gets one around the world or we will never be safe. Thank you so much. Um, and you know, that obviously sort of draws to some of these other parallels on the international affairs front um, about 
the the sword and the shield that you mentioned earlier as well and how right now we need to serve as a shield and the government needs to serve as a shield not just the media and everything else um and you know instead of pursuing economic warfare and military intervention and broader militarism overall we could be helping with humanitarian assistance, vaccine equity at this critical time and development aid. Um, and so many folks were curious as to, you know, how do we make that narrative stronger? How, how do we make peace more profitable than war? How can we get the media outside of just your own work um, to really focus on these critical tools and their importance? Um, how can we help well, you shift think, that media narrative? <laughs> I, I think we have to also demand that the media reflect the voices of those on the ground, both internationally and at home. Militarism abroad, uh, the counterpart at home is police brutality, for example, the militarization of the police in this country. And here we are right now, um, of course, uh, protests all over the country this weekend. I mean, because the killings by police of young African-Americans and Latinx uh, men and women is at such a dire point. I mean, the fact that Adam Toledo, a 13 year old boy in Chicago, and we're gonna talk more about this tomorrow with Lilia Fernandez, a professor at Rutgers University who's writing a book on police brutality in the Latinx community. A 13 year old boy was gunned down by a police officer who told him to turn around and put up his hands. And there is several video, including police body cam video that shows he did just that. He followed orders, he had no weapon in his hands and he was shot dead. This happened two weeks ago, but the video was just released. It's so, so important to see those images. Um, and then, of course, um, you have the killing of Dante Wright. I mean, the idea that a police officer who is a lead trainer in the Brooklyn Center, Minnesota police force, um, pulls out her gun, her Glock, instead of her taser, when the gun is on the dominant hand side, the taser is on the other side. She is a trainer in the police force for 26 years. The gun is black. The taser is a uh, school bus yellow. It's in front of her. She screams taser, taser, taser. And you see in her body cam video that it's a gun. And she didn't, it wasn't like she's killing a massacrist, you know, someone who's opening fire on people. This is a young unarmed man who had air freshener hanging from his mirror. I think as a white person, we don't even know that's illegal because no cop would stop us for that. And yet he was a 20 year old African, young African-American. And I think we have to link these issues and this makes certainly makes the movements more diverse. It's the issue of police brutality at home with militarism abroad. And we have to focus on all of this and also ensure that the media brings you the voices of people in the movements, not just that small circle of pundits you got on all the networks who know mm -hmm. so little about so much explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. The media is critical. It's how we come to understand the world and how the world comes to understand us. And we have to be able to see the world and they us through something other than a corporate lens. Why independent media, for example, like WBAI 99.5 FM in New York and now online, all the independent media is so important, democracynow.org, because it is a lens that is not brought to you by corporations that profit from the killing. They're making a killing off the killing. Yes, certainly. Uh, I have a bit of a cough myself, so thank you for also being with us when you have a cold. Really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, sticking to the media narratives and, and, you know, the way that corporate media does work on profits and, and um, you know, focusing on those kinds of narratives. Uh, I am curious about the, the coverage right now of the Derek Chauvin trial that's been going on. Obviously, all of the media has been profiting from this and so actually reporting it. Um, and, you know, I feel like 
mainstream social new and old media alike has kept referring to this as different than in the past, whereas many folks realize that it isn't, it's just being more broadly televised. Um, do you agree? Do you think that this is some sort of inflection point or different than previous trials, previous killings? Um, you know, I recently interviewed um, um, let's see, who are some of the people that we interviewed? Well, during the trial, it's been absolutely critical to really analyze what was being said. But then going outside of that, even before that, I interviewed Angela Davis and asked if, you know, she sees this moment, and this was through the pandemic with Black Lives Matter activists marching in the streets as a turning point. And she, you know, who has been in the movement for uh, how many decades said she really does. And I think that's really instructive. Um, this is an, ab I mean, just the fact that this trial is televised, that the whole country can learn, you know, about how the system works, that we saw this videotape. You know, something that I think of, um, my colleague Dennis Moynihan and I write a weekly column that goes out in newspapers and websites around the world. And we wrote a column on what is the hope um, coming out of the George Floyd, uh, out of this last year. I mean, there's no hope in what happened to him, the horror of losing him. But the fact that on that day, Memorial Day 2020, so many different people who did not know each other or him came forward, came upon the scene at what, nine o'clock in the evening and stopped. They didn't walk. This is not a Kitty Genovese affair where they just ignored what was happening. Everyone did something. And that is what's so astounding. The seven-year-old, the nine-year-old girl, the 17-year-old girl who filmed, that was an act of resistance. The mixed martial artist who says to Chauvin, you know what you're doing. You're putting him in a blood choke. He said it was the only time Chauvin looked up and directly looked in his eye. He said, indicating he knew what he was doing. You had um, the white, firefighter, uh, EMT, who happened to be taking a walk in the neighborhood. And she comes upon this. She is so horrified. She says, let me take his pulse. And then when she sees they're not allowing this, they said, then you take his pulse. And then when she can't do anything about this, she flips open her phone. And then she calls 911, just like the mixed martial artist did. He is watching the police murder this man on the ground with the full weight, not only of one police officer, but three and one protecting them during this killing. And the mixed martial artist calls the police and says, I'm calling the police on the police. He just didn't know what to do, but each person did something. That's the hope. And then we, at this point, you know, see this amazing prosecution case laid out under Keith Ellison, the attorney general of Minnesota. Um, and then we see the few people the defense puts forward, one of them, Dr. David Fowler, who is the former medical examiner in Maryland. He is being sued for what he did in Maryland, a very similar case of a young man, police sat on him, white police officers, and he ultimately died. And they say he covered up that autopsy and held it for months. They're suing him. He testifies in the Minnesota trial of Derek Chauvin. And so linking these police brutality cases together, um, you know, I see our job is to connect the dots, is to be that link all over this country and around the world. You know, independent media knows no borders. Um, uh, it is there, and I see democracy now, you know, I'm very excited. Now we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. Usually we hold a big event like at our 20th, but with the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. But 25 years of democracy now, um, providing a forum for people across the world I see it as a huge kitchen table, the media, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most critical issues of the day. 
war and peace and life and death and anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, since we're running low on time, I'm now going to shift us into some audience questions as well. Um, and once again, thank you for your time. I'm going to kick it off um, with Paul Suravels, who is the chair of South Mountain Peace Action. Um, he asks, and you know, sort of tying into Democracy Now!, he says, Amy, a former Democracy Now! producer, Aaron Mate, an anti-war journalist who writes for The Nation and produces the show Pushback, has broken many stories based on testimony by whistleblowers and a former director of the OPCW, which for those who aren't aware is the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, um, that raised serious doubts about allegations of chemical weapons used by the Syrian government. When do you plan on inviting Aaron on the air to discuss his reporting on the issue um, or further discussing that issue on your show? Um, you know, I think that is a critical issue is, you know, all the period in Syria, um, what exactly took place. Uh, we have looked at that issue before and may well continue to do so uh, right now, focusing on what's happening in this country and what's happening around the world around militarism. But it, you know, it's an important point and it's important to hear the voices of everyone on this issue, especially those directly involved. Thank you. And I'm sure Paul will be pleased to see more on that um, as it's covered. We also had a question from Bob Rousseau, the um, council member and former mayor at Montclair. And um, he is wondering about how we stand up to the badness of Trump Republicans even there in Montclair, but um, throughout the country. I mean, obviously with Trump out of office, we're finding that a lot of his diehard followers are still very staunch about just obstructing any progress. So would you have any advice on how oh, to stand up? I mean, this is not a minor question. I mean, we just had the American insurrection uh, mm -hmm. January 6th, when you have thousands of people march on the Capitol and the Capitol police are instructed not to um, have, uh, not to deal with them uh, in any way, like, for example, they dealt with the Black Lives Matter protests, um, which were overwhelmingly peaceful. This was overwhelmingly violent. Um, the idea that these uh, mainly white men, some women, uh, smashed their way into the Capitol, threatening lawmakers, going after lawmakers. We saw the... Um, we saw um, a, the dress rehearsal in Michigan, and you had a group of um, men who President Trump refused to condemn, uh, who were arrested for, uh, to pl uh, for plotting to kidnap Governor Whitmer and possibly execute her. And then they moved on to the Capitol. And it is so critical to look at who these people were and encourage people to go to democracynow.org and um, uh, see the interview we just did with AC Thompson and Rick Rowley on their frontline ProPublica documentary called American Insurrection, um, where they really look at the people involved in this insurrection and the idea that this disproportionate number of these protesters were police or military. The idea that when they brought the National Guard in to protect the Capitol, they then had to screen the National Guard and remove a number of them because of where their allegiance was. I mean, the idea that right now, the first African-American Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin, is conducting now an investigation into white supremacist units and white supremacists infiltrating the military, um, that there is the fact that on January 6th, you had these police officers and off-duty police officers and military who were beating the police themselves, particularly in the crosshairs where the African-American Capitol Police and DC Police, it was just terrifying, horrifying, and goes to the disparate 
um, policing that goes on in this country and why it's so important in looking at the Derek Chauvin case and others not to one off them. Oh, we have to, you know, get the bad apple. Um, we are talking about a structural problem throughout this country. Definitely. Um, with that, I have one more question if you have time for that and voice left. <laughs> so um, you mentioned previously the new Cold War uh, aggression toward Russia and China ramping up, um, obviously being used to fuel more militarism in this country. Uh, so there was a question about um, the recent remarks by Secretary Blinken um, in, in the opening statements around, you know, the, the Chinese meeting, um, as well as President Biden's yes in response to a question about, you know, whether uh, President Putin would be called a killer. And so uh, folks were curious about, you know, what your explanation to that is, um, you know, and, and those statements is there's some sort of domestic or foreign policy strategy in these sorts of undiplomatic statements, or is it, you know, as concerning as we are concerned it will be? <laughs> Sorry, can you say the beginning of that question again? Um, so the, the recent response by President Biden about yes in regards to Putin being a killer, uh, as well as the um, meeting with the Chinese where there was quite a bit of tension in the opening remarks and statements. Uh, do you think that it's a strategic play or I'm, is it just more militarism? I mean, I think- for concern? I think these are extremely important questions. We just uh, interviewed Anatole Levin, uh, who's a professor at Georgetown uh, in Doha, Qatar, um, talking about these issues, the issue of pulling out of Afghanistan, which is a good thing, but not then creating this kind of new cold war with Russia and then you know, being militaristic towards China. This is a moment to reimagine the future and this is an absolutely critical moment for movements uh, to reconstitute around foreign policy because clearly the Biden-Harris administration, um, uh, while they may not naturally go in this direction, um, they are surrounded by a whole spectrum of people that include progressives and those voices must be heard we can't afford this militarism uh, any longer in any sense. And I think that is not up to the people in the White House, it's up to movements. Very well said. Um, and, you know, thank you for being one of those people. And you may have seen in the chat some thank yous popping up. Obviously, every single attendee and member of New Jersey Peace Action, Peace Action, the peace community is grateful to you for your years of service, years of work, um, and, and help in putting these things well, you know, and being where the silence is and, and putting a voice to these issues. And so we're very, very grateful for you joining us today. Well, I want to thank everyone for celebrating New Jersey Peace Action and encourage people to go to democracynow.org. It's a daily grassroots global news hour. Um, and, you know, I definitely see that the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth bringing on the voices of peace activists, those who are fighting against war. Instead, all too often it's wielded as a weapon of war, but we can take the media back. So thank you everyone and democracy now. Since folks are muted, I'll give you a round of applause since you won't be hearing the swelling applause yeah. happening at home right yeah. now. But thank you again. I hope your dog feels better. I hope you feel better. And back to Jeff. To close us out. Thank you so much. Ah, uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you to others too. Bennett, Shar, Lily. Great, great job, Lily. Amy, thank you so much for your time here today. That was everything you do every day is inspiring, but this was particularly inspiring to us. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here. Um, great seeing you again. Great seeing you again. Thank you all to all the attendees for what you do for peace. Um, please make sure you join us for our quarterly meeting on June 10th and our weekly vigils in Montclair and other towns, Morristown, Teaneck and Leonia. Please let us know how you can help um, with our lobby meetings going forward so we can work on these 
these very, very important issues that need, the legislators need pushing on this stuff. They're not gonna do it without people talking to them every day about it. We could not do what we do without you. Um, please watch for an email. There'll be an email follow-up on this great afternoon. And I thank you all again for being here. That concludes our 2021 spring, spring peace gathering. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Peace and democracy now. Thank you.